Well, good morning. I, I can't compete with that, I'm afraid. Um, apart from the fact that technology is far beyond my knowledge, um, we're coming back into the physical world and how the physical world, I guess, supports uh, uh, this sort of initiative. Um, so we're going to tell you a bit about the college. Hopefully, we won't repeat too much about yesterday. Um, and what we've been doing recently, trying to bring the estate into the 21st century from, in some cases, the 19th century. Um, I went to university a long time ago, <coughs> in the 1970s. None of these uh, organisations existed then. Um, by the time we get forward, some of them may well have disappeared, um, uh, as companies are, are changing all the time, like HMV, for example, and organisations like that. We are in a fast-changing world in which uh, organizations in which technology is continually changing and I would challenge any of you to predict today what the new technology will be in 10 years time. The trouble with property and buildings of course is it takes a long time to build so we are trying to anticipate what is coming uh, in a world of constant change. Um, and I picked this off of, of a website which suggested that all of these will have disappeared within 10 years. So how you know Last time I used a stamp, I think I've only used one this year, for example. Everything is done by email. Uh, I think I've only used one check, which, funny enough, is to pay the college something, but never mind. So it's a, the college is a wee bit old-fashioned. I, I hesitate to say that books will have died, because I, I, I like books, but certainly you know, newspapers are under threat. So we are in a fast-changing world, as, as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, the college uh, has a very... Um, Diverse estate, some of you saw the chapel yesterday. We go back in buildings to the 18th century to buildings that are still in construction today. So a very wide uh, estate, five campuses in the heart of London, which makes it a very challenging estate in terms of bringing the college community together. Um, and in indeed in terms of investing uh, in, in new technologies. We started a programme of investment about five years ago the, uh, to try and improve college facilities, which were then a wee bit old-fashioned. We still had those quaint things called 35 mil slide projectors. Who remembers them? Overhead slide projectors. I remember them. Well, we, we have a cupboard downstairs. It's called a museum, uh, in which we have these things now. Um, and that, you know, that's not that long ago, really. So we started um, an investment program one of the first projects is actually the most high technology room we have in this campus, which was an old anatomy museum, part of the 19th century medical school. It's where they used to store bits of bodies in formaldehyde. Just to prove that if a space is designed well, it can actually be used 20, you know, a century later for a complete range of new technologies. So I think there are lessons there for architects of the future about building in flexibility of space. Uh, again, we, we started to look at um, investment in other facilities. And one of the problems with universities is very often we're organised in silos. So the catering department has a restaurant, the library has a library, the IT department has computer rooms, etc., etc. What we've been trying to do at King's is break down these boundaries. And this was a project at Guy's where the catering contractor wanted to refurbish the cafe. We wanted to create much more flexible space for students, whether they were eating or not. And <coughs> horror of horrors, we wanted the students to be able to access the cafe when they weren't serving food, which the catering contractor was, you know, security, etc. But we persuaded them. We invested some money. The catering con contractor invested some money. We involved the student community. Um, and we now have a space that flows from the cafe to the reception area. And when it's shut and they're not serving food, that area is closed off. The students can still use it as a flexible study space. Uh, as part of that investment, we've refurbished virtually every library in the college over the last five years. Massive investment, um, rationalising particularly periodical collections, because most of that is obviously now online. Um, also rationalising duplicate copies of books across the campuses and building in the sort of flexible space that students like. Sometimes horror of horror to librarians, enabling them to have coffee uh, in the library. Also enabling them to... You don't, but you're a new modern librarian. 
um, but also enabling the coffee areas to be used as study areas. So this blending of spaces, um, which you might hear a little bit more. Again, in contemporary, I call it funky uh, furniture that students like, to give them a variety of environments. There are still students who like the very quiet study area. There are others who want group spaces. There are, frankly, just love to be in a buzz of Starbucks coffee shop and that sort of thing. So th this, is a, this is not unique to the college. This was taken from some, some other projects. But the aim was to create environments in which different students could study, and discover, gather, analyze, create, and share. Um, all within the space of what used to be called, and indeed is still called, a library. And the other thing we did was we brought some of the college inquiry services together, rather than have them in sort of five or six different places across the college, to make it easier for the students to access uh, the college's inquiries. So again, modern, bright, airy environments. Connecting floors together uh, in ways that weren't quite there before. And one of the keys, of course, to remember is people will think in five years' time this is still new. We have to keep doing this. So we have to continually invest every year in upgrading our facilities. It's not a once-off, and then we all go, phew, we've done that. So AV and IT has only got a three- to five-year life when the next technology comes along. So what the college is having to do is continually invest in its learning and teaching facilities. Fortunately, AVE becomes less and less expensive, um, but just doing every teaching room in the college, we have nearly 300 teaching rooms, and bringing them up to not quite the standard necessarily is a huge exercise. So we have been working progressively through all uh, the teaching rooms in the college, putting in modern technology, lecture capture, uh, which the college still hasn't really um, fully addressed, but we're putting the facilities to enable that to happen. So I want to talk a little about a project on this campus and what we've been doing here. Um, the Strand is the original campus of King's, built in the 1830s. Um, and the building on the other side that you were in last night was the first phase of a redevelopment. This actually shows four phases of redevelopment. The King's building on this side, uh, which we refurbished, that you had the reception and dinner in last night. The building at the far end, which is the 1980s building, we refurbished the top three floors as mod modern office and um, PhD study space. The building you're in now is here under scaffolding, uh, the east wing of Somerset House. And be believe it or not, underneath the grey tarmac are two floors. It's called the quadrangle. And we'll come to that in a minute. So some of you were looking at these spaces last night, I noticed. Uh, this was... These were refurbished about six years ago, was the old library, which has now moved to Chantry Lane. The aim was to make them bright, airy, friendly, flexible, the heart of the campus and the offices above. Uh, we introduced light, for example, into the corridors, rather than have those long corridors of um, doors. Th these are the sort of PhD study areas and flexible spaces we created at the top of the 1980s building. Uh, and this is uh, the building that you're in at the moment. The quadrangle, as I mentioned, is the grey asphalt space between this building and our other building. But it, it, it was one of, are there any Germans here? No, oh, good. One of the best things the Germans did during the Second World War is they bombed the quadrangle. It couldn't have been better planned if I had sort of asked them to do it. So. Fortunately, it didn't damage too much else. It just came down in the middle. Before that, it was, a, it was a brick. It was like wine vaults. It was really brick arches. So after the Second World War, the college in the 50s effectively built uh, two floors of laboratories and offices underground. That's where we like to keep our staff. Now, you, you realise that 60 years has gone. It's very run down. The roof leaks, very old-fashioned. And the question is, what do we do with that space? So the aim was to create, or is to create, a student-centred heart to the campus. What is that? The problem is there's nobody, no one person has a view about what that space should be. And it's not like some of the other buildings, like this one is so constrained because it's historic, 
<coughs> you, you've almost got to create the building you've got to create. Here we've got an open canvas. And that's actually the most difficult question. It's like being in a green field and saying, right, what do you want? Uh, constrained by finances and other things. And people were saying, oh, we kind of, we don't know. But we did know we wanted to be innovative and look to the future. Because by the time we build this, we are building this for the 15-year-old, or perhaps your son, of tomorrow. We're not even building it for the current students. So we've really got to try and think out of the box, as we call it here, into the future. It was, uh, originally, it had boat ramps down to the river because the embankment wasn't there. Um, and of course, this campus is famous for where DNA was invented. It wasn't Cambridge at all. Um, and that's the, the bomb damage uh, during the war. As I say, ve very lucky bomb just came right down in the middle. I couldn't have planned it better myself. Um, very unexciting space but well connected into other places. So the project had a number of components. One was the landscape. We have a very successful uh, garden at Guy's where students use it as a study area in summer. It's Wi-Fi enabled. So we wanted a decent landscape here that could be an outdoor room uh, to the campus, somewhere pleasant, but somewhere which was a learning environment uh, as much as inside the building. This is the current building, as you say, not very exciting, but the aim is to create uh, what Sheffield University, for example, called a learning commons, a space for learning, study, social interactive, a, a, a student hub. One of the biggest criticisms we have of this campus in this new competitive world is our identity on the Strand. Uh, this 1980s building is not very elegant. It doesn't represent uh, the, the quality of work that goes on within King's College. So one of the aims, is to, and the entrance is a bit of a dump, to be frank. Um, so one of the aims was to actually to liven up our connection with the street uh, and also connect into other facilities. One of the advantages of being underground is we can actually connect into other buildings like this one uh, and the other building that you were in last night and to other major facilities and lecture theatres. So what did we do? We had nobody that knew really what we wanted. So what we did was we had a six-month program of engagement with stakeholders, with students, staff, uh, some outside people as well, using a firm called Nomad, who come from Scotland, Whee! Um, who, who are working for quite a lot of universities with the same problem, <coughs> really trying to get the views of um, of the stakeholders um, as to what this project might be, using a blend from both, not just the university world, but using the experiences from the commercial world. Because universities don't necessarily just have the, the only knowledge about these environments. There's lots of examples in the commercial world as well. So the aim was to bring these two together. Um, and being modern technology, of course, the core was a project blog hosted in the UK. <laughs> it's now hosted uh, by the uh, college itself. It was hosted by Nomad. Lots of field work, interviews with people. Um, and on the blog, they, they raise a series of questions, workshops, uh, and research. This, the sort of white um, inflama uh, inflatable was one of the booths we set up in the college here for the consultants to interview students. Um, various workshops, they got to do exercises about what they think, thought it might be. They went to visit four reference sites picked by the students themselves. One was Google's HQ in London, because Google is kind of you know, funky and exciting and all the rest of it, the place to work. The one at this side is Queen Mary University in London, designed by um, Will Alsop. It's a medical school building, a project at Imperial College. And interesting, the Royal Festival Hall, which is really just a big concert hall, but it has at its heart very flexible spaces. So they do graduations, they do art shows, they do dancing, um, they have bars, cafes. Um, and all the organisations there, I have to say, were really helpful in terms of taking groups of our students and some staff around, telling them what they liked, what worked, what didn't like, uh, in order to inform the blog. Just to show you how complicated it is, and you, obviously you'll get copies of the slides in the, on the website, 
These are the stakeholders that have to be consulted. There is no way that we could individually go and meet all these stakeholders. It would take us about 10 years. Hence the project blog uh, and other techniques just to gather that information. And on the blog, we had a huge response, a really good response. Actually, one of the best responses the consultants have had from any university. Universities like ours are very complicated. And if you have time to do stakeholder engagement, everybody has, a, has an opinion, everybody has to be consulted. In your pack eventually, I'm not going to go through this in detail, will be an electronic copy of the results of the, um, the consultation. But I'll just go through some of, uh, some of the highlights rather than go through the slide, just to show you the sort of information that was coming up. So for an example, what the stakeholders said on this campus, it will be on the website uh, later, is that they had two study modes that were predominant. 41% were very focused, 29% were relaxed. Not surprisingly, 48% said they studied in the library, 29% studied at home, and 23% other. What was interesting was, on the Strand, the favorite places, one was a sort of informal terrace cafe area at 23%, the library was only 13%. The bar was 6%. So 6% of our students prefer to study in the bar to anywhere else. Uh, and I'll give you some more of the highlights there. And it is actually quite quirky. You go into the bar at 10 o'clock, maybe 10, 13, you find some of the pint of beer and a laptop uh, doing their studying. Uh, very Scandinavian. <laughs> They also sort of came up with what you might call the ideal layout for the quad, uh, very stylized, obviously, with the strand at the bottom and the river at the bottom. Some of this was more about the campus and the actual quad, for example. Um, some of the facilities couldn't possibly fit in the quad, but it helps us look at the future planning of the campus. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through this in detail because it, um, you can't read it here, but I'll give you some of the highlights. Um, I've mentioned study. So following on from the previous speaker, which of any of the following websites do you use? Wikipedia was 31%, Facebook 23%, YouTube 20%, iGoogle or Google 15 something called delicious bookmarks, which sounds like a restaurant. <laughs> no? Anyway. Um, what kinds of technology do you use or carry? Smartphone or iPhone, 47%. Laptop, 34%. Uh, and actually at that point, Kindle, I think will have risen up, was only 2%. What kind of space do you want? It was quite interesting. Actually, they didn't, they didn't particularly like what we consider to be the sort of normal library spaces. Um, the, the, some did, like 60% did want a large table, a comfortable chair, we normally provide hard chairs so they don't fall asleep, um, and a lamp. 10% wanted a sofa um, or, a, or an armchair with a coffee lamp. 57% um, preferred to have more spaces even though you were t utilitarian rather than less spaces that were more comfortable. They wanted it to be student-centered, relaxed, cultured, contemporary. The architecture was surprisingly important. 40% thought that the architecture influenced um, the way that they would study. And the art, which we have incorporated uh, with Gary's help into most of these projects. And then there was a bit about King's identity, because we're always trying to see what, uh, how we enhance our identity. 26% thought that the Quad project should enhance our identity of being part of London. 22% thought it should enhance the history of Kings. 20% thought it should enhance the global reputation of Kings. 18% thought it should be classical, i.e. 18th century style of architecture. Um, and and 57% said the identity of the building was actually quite important to them, which is quite a surprise, really. Uh, one of the other interesting things is, what tools do you think stu students predominantly will use in the future? The internet and social media, 78%. So 78% of current students 
think that future students will be using that as the predominant tool. Um, that's quite spooky. Only 17% said books. Um, so these are the sort of things that you, we need to think about. 40% thought you, the predominant study would, mode would be on campus. 36% thought it would be off campus. So, that, so there's a sort of a balance here about, not surprisingly, where students study. Now, what was interesting was we threw in a question about what facilities or services would you want? Some of this, again, is campus rather than library. One was a cash machine for the bank, 10% wanted. 3% wanted beds, which must tie in with the Facebook uh, images. They claim it was somewhere to nap, but uh, there we are. Critically important, of course, were things like mobile, mobile phone charging docks. Um, and those sort of things. So the facilities that support um, the weaknesses, if you say, in technology, which is the batteries always running out. Um, so what we have done is we've taken that brief and we're, again, trying to look for innovative ideas. We ran an architectural competition, which is less com common in the UK than it is in Europe, where many public um, com projects are competitions. Um, we have the Royal Institute of British Architects ran it. We had an assessor who was very good. And the idea was to get ideas from outside the normal university architect sector. So the idea was to get someone who's worked in retail or works in Google environments, not people who are steeped in the ways that we've always done things. So we had prizes, we had a good set of judges, including the facilities director of Google, um, and we, we came down to a shortlist of six firms who we then paid uh, to take it through to a design which was exhibited in this building uh, so that staff and students could give their feedback. And I'll just show you some of the results. Um, this is a British architect. He, he's done a lot of work in classical environments, kind of you know, cool, classical, but in terms of a learning environment, rather old fashioned to be honest. Uh, interesting, this architect had taken the DNA symbol uh, rather to excess, into staircases and other ways. And it looked interesting, but we thought it would be, be like avocado bathrooms, you know, which were very popular in the 70s. After a year or two, it would date. Zaha Hadid, who you might know, who's one of our most uh, famous international architects, came up with actually which was something which is quite simple, perhaps slightly disappointing for her, just basically a box in which we could house anything we liked. Uh, a Spanish practice uh, um, came up with something that gave grandeur, but the students didn't like this. They thought it was too much like the entrance to a concert hall or an art gallery or that sort of thing. It kind of lacked um, warmth, I think is the phrase. The one that came out highest in the staff-student consultation was another uh, Spanish architect, Camille Pino, uh, because it was a garden. Lots and lots of trees. Um, interestingly, it's also the one which our planners, um, the city planners, didn't like the most because they don't think a garden fits in this environment. Um, so, but it was an interesting scheme. And it gave lots of space, lots of light cascading down. The winners were a Belfast firm. Uh, they have never worked in a university before, which is great because we can teach them all about universities. They came up with a historical reference in terms of the front entrance, going back to the buildings that were there before we knocked them all down. Um, there's a bit of a garden to it, so there's some planting, there's light cascading down into the spaces below. And basically, it is a flexible space. Um, so the idea is basically, we can cope with future technologies future innovation. Obviously, it'll be a high technology space um, because you can take things away and change them. This is a project they have done in Belfast, an art centre, and you can see the sort of spaces that they're thinking about that we might achieve here. So these are the winners who are now working on the detail of the competition. Now, one of the issues for Kings is that we are growing. With the change in government policy, we're actually growing in terms of student numbers in a very constrained environment. So we're doing a lot of work at the moment about um, future growth. Uh, so we're now looking at the next phase of redevelopment of the campus. And this is the, these are the existing buildings here. 
Um, including quality issues, again, as part of the student experience, we need to improve the quality of many of facilities. But it also gives us opportunities where you see an improved public space for, again, another big, flexible, but different uh, student space, which could even be roofed over as a sort of winter garden or something like that. Now, um, I was asked to say something about student residencies. One of the issues for King's in terms of our growth and our reputation is that the student residence has risen up the agenda. At King's it used to be kind of seen as an option, but both in terms of the academic activity and in terms of our competitiveness in the international environment, the student residence is now seen as far more important. And if you remember, a large number of students study out with the campuses. So a lot of our students will be studying in their student residence. So this is a scheme in Denmark Hill where we're actually demolishing an existing residence built in the 70s and replacing it with about 720 student bedrooms. They'll all be internet accessed. There'll be space for other activities to take place there. There'll probably be a gym, very importantly. Um, and it will be a very pleasant, sustainable uh, environment, again, so that the students hopefully can use the areas outside as part of their learning experience. One of the other things King's is looking at is, is in that context, a new residential campus. So we actually want to build 2,000 additional student bedrooms in the most expensive real estate in Western Europe. Very difficult. Certainly around here it's impossible, but there's, no, there's nowhere to buy the land. So we are looking at another campus. Um, so you might think with five campuses we've got quite enough. So one of the questions, of course, is what sort of environment, if you've got 2,000 students, what do you place there alongside it that makes it an academic residential campus? One of the questions that we haven't got the answer to, for example, is um, our medical school teaches 500 students at a time, is that the way of the future? Should we build a lecture theatre here for 500 students? Talking to my colleagues in America, they say, you're mad. 500 lecture, seater lecture theatre is not the way that organisations are going anymore, using digital um, provision of lectures. So we're having a debate in the college, um, really, about what if we are going to build new teaching facilities, a new campus, Bringing in new technology, what would those facilities be? Do we have big lecture theatres anymore, or do we have far more tutorial, seminar, Harvard-style meeting rooms, and that sort of thing? Um, here there will also be a sports centre with a gym, a swimming pool, um, and other facilities supporting the residential campus. We'll also build uh, flats for staff. So one, if you've got 2,000 students, then you can have tutorials there as well if you actually have staff living on the campus. It's kind of not quite the Cambridge model, but it also means that we can attract junior staff to London. So we are really looking at how we can use this opportunity. It's very much early days yet. As you can sense, the discussion is still, still happening. But in that, the digital media and digital provision of courses, how it connects with the other campuses, uh, will be a huge part of that debate. Just a quick final thing on sustainability because I also look after the carbon uh, reduction commitment of the college. Our students expect that whatever we do will contribute towards the carbon reduction. Staff, kind of it's not really on their radar, but the students just expect they are doing it. So even though we're increasing the size of the college estate, we are aiming to reduce our carbon uh, emissions. You, this is from University of San Diego, because I happened to be on holiday and popped in there uh, last year. The American universities, yes, it is sad, but there, <laughs> I enjoy my job. American universities are really embracing sustainability in a way that puts us to shame, frankly, in this country. So it's an area that we do need to, to look at. Of course, the trouble is when we add in more technology, it actually adds in more power and other requirements. So we really need to work very hard at how these conflicting um, agendas all come together. But we have reduced our carbon um, emissions by 18%, even though we expanded the estate. And this is one of the most sustainable buildings, believe it or not, on the college. Um, it's 
we have a classification system, and this is called Bream Excellent. So it's probably as sustainable as you could make a historic building be in terms of its uh, carbon. So, any questions? Happy, but just remind you, we are building for a number of audiences. For the academic professor who is of my generation, perhaps even older, and for the school children of today who will be our students of tomorrow. The key question for any of you who are looking at these sort of facilities in universities is how do we build in that flexibility for the future? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.